again, good morning. Good to be with you. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, because I think I know most of you, but just in case we haven't been introduced, my name is Andy Lovelace. I'm the lead pastor here at New Horizons. And we are in the midst of a new series on the book of Psalms. Uh, we are going to be looking at Psalm 2 this morning. And the book of Psalms, uh, we did a brief introduction. I'm going to recap that a little bit uh, this morning from last week, our introduction. Because Psalms 1 and 2 really fit as an introduction to the whole book of Psalms. Now, we don't typically see it that way because uh, we, we often, or I'll speak for myself, often just look at the book of Psalms as 150 different poems or songs that were written, hymns, and they're just kind of all thrown in there, right? Just this big library of songs, right? But they actually have some organization to them. Uh, they're split into, divided into five books, divided out that way, and that's why when you read through the book of Psalms, you might notice where it says book one, and you go through a certain amount, and then you get to book two, book three, book four, book five. And so that is, the, the intention of that is so that it mirrors uh, the five books of Moses. And so it is, a, in a sense, they're separate playlists of worship and ways to engage in worship. And so that's one way that I think about it, and that's why we use that imagery there, is kind of like uh, modern times you might, whether you use Spotify or some other resource, to create a playlist. And oftentimes we'll put together playlists based on what we're doing, what we're thinking, and kind of movements that we want those songs or poems to be together. And songs, in a sense, is written the same way into these different, different playlists. So you've got the five books, and each one of those five books concludes with a doxology. So there's a bit of a kind of a culmination, right? It's a recognition of God's uh, glory, God's praise being uh, sent up to him. But in, in, uh, along with that, uh, the first ones that I mentioned, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, are in a sense an introduction, and they give us this overarching picture of what the whole 150 Psalms is going to be about. Uh, and we don't know the authors. They're, those are listed unknown. Most of the others, there are some other unknowns, but the majority of them are David, but there are other authors for these uh, Psalms as well. So it's not all David, but he did write a significant portion of them. So these, these first two, we looked at last week, Psalm 1, and Psalm 1 is a wisdom psalm. And so we'll get to the genres in just a moment. I'll review that. But it's a wisdom psalm that contrasts what happens when we choose to live apart from God versus what happens when we live with God. And so it's, it's putting these two ways of living life up against one another. So the intention is really to direct our focus back to the Garden of Eden. And sometimes we miss this as followers of Jesus. We spend a lot of time in the New Testament, and rightfully so, we should, right? Discovering through the Gospels, we discover the life of Christ and his teachings. Uh, throughout Acts, we see kind of a history of the early church and how God was on the move in the early church. And Paul's letters, some doctrinal, some teaching and an application. But there's very important things that get communicated in origin stories, how things began, right? And so when we look back to the garden, what God was doing there, he was setting in place, and the way that the origin story that God tells how life began is that he's contrasting that very same thing right from the beginning. The intent is that I will be in the garden, I will be your God, you will be my people, and we're going to fellowship together in this garden. There's not going to be anything between us, right? That was the idea with Adam and with God. And then also Eve, who is a part of Adam, and that's the way it says, he didn't just take a rib of him, he took a half of him, right? So his other half. And so they're in fellowship with God. Well, what happens ultimately, he says, listen, you can't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You, you're, you're going to live with me in the garden and you're going to live under you know, my guidance and I'm going to define for you what's good and what's evil. And when I do that, you're going to flourish. You're going to have life. And the, the garden is going to produce everything you need and we're going to live together. But those of us who are familiar with the story knows how that goes. They say, nope, <laughs> you're holding back from us, God. 
you're not giving us the whole story. And they're actually tempted by the serpent who tells them God is holding back. He doesn't want you to know what he knows. And they make the choice in the story in the garden. They make the choice. They say, I think the serpent is right. God isn't right. And so I want to know what God knows. We're going to choose for ourselves what is good and what is evil. That gives us the whole picture, really, of what then is the battle that goes on continually throughout all of Scripture. Mankind defining for, defining for themselves how life should be lived. Is it going to be on their terms or is it going to be on God's terms? Are we going to live under God's rule or are we going to live under our own rule, our right, our life, our way? Well, the psalmist is saying the same thing in the wisdom psalm, Psalm 1, which it introduces the genre of wisdom psalms, but it also covers over the whole book of psalms and says you're going to see this contrast over and over throughout the whole book of psalms of people who decide to define life on their terms apart from God and those who plant themselves firmly in God's instruction. And when it uses the word uh, instruction, it's re it is referring to the law of God and the scriptures and God's teaching, but it also is referring to a much broader sense, just learning from God himself, sitting at the feet of God and hearing how to live life as God leads them. And so those who do that, those who live in fellowship with God, the psalmist writes in Psalm 1, those people are like a tree planted by streams of water, right? And they just grow out and fruit comes out of their life and they flourish in that life. And so that's the picture that the psalmist writes in Psalm 1. In Psalm 2, which we'll look at today in just a moment, that's a royal psalm. That's another genre, royal psalms. And this is, uh, along with Psalm 1, it's part of this general introduction. And Psalm 2 expands really on what Psalm 1 expresses. Psalm 1 says, at an individual level, you can choose to live for God or apart from God. And the ways in which you choose that are going to have a direct effect in the life that you experience. Psalm 2 continues on that same theme and says, that's not just true for you as an individual, that's true of the community that you're a part of. Whether that community is just your family, your extended family, your neighborhood, your community, your nation, or the world itself. Right? So it goes down to just a micro community, the smallest element of your community, but it's all the way up to a, a nation. And it essentially is going to tell us that what, it, what we just talked about in Psalm 1, where living with God and under his guidance, there's flourishing, living apart from him, there's destruction. And Psalm 2 is going to point us in that direction. But let me go back for just a moment to last week where we have the genres, because a couple things that I want to highlight. Um, we have a slide that just shows two different resources that you can pick up. They're on the table as you head out this morning. They're on a black table by our exit doors. And um, we've broken down the different psalms into the genres. So there's wisdom psalms last week, June 12th, royal psalms uh, this week. Next week in our psalms of lament, uh, June 26th. And then along with that same group is a subcategory of imprecatory psalms. Those are the ones where there's anger mixed in with them. Lord, break the teeth of the liar. You know, they're very strong spoken psalms of lament. Uh, and then praise, July 3rd. Hymns and psalms of ascent, July 10th. Thanksgiving, July 17th. And July 24th is trust. And then all the correlating psalms that tie into that. You can pick that sheet up again on the way out. The other thing that we have for you uh, is Mark Harris developed a weekly devotional that goes along with each genre of psalms that we're uh, reading through. And so this week there is a devotional for week two, uh, which ties back to royal psalms. And for each of those, there's a day that it goes through one of the uh, psalms, not all of them, but it just picks uh, one of the royal psalms that is up there and you can go through it. And he gives an example of how you might go through that and then it gives you an opportunity to take that step as well. Hopefully you got a chance to do it last week. Uh, if you didn't, you can pick one up this week, take it with you, and it'll give you an opportunity to do a deeper dive in, uh, into Royal Psalms and Psalm 2 uh, this coming week. So that's on the back table 
as well. Mark, thank you for that. That's a real helpful resource. So that this stuff, our desire is this stuff gets into our lives, right? It's not just something we attend, but it's something we engage in and we participate and we wrestle with. So this idea is that we have different genres, just like we have different genres of music and movies, so the Psalms have different genres. They're not all the same. And so understanding the genre helps us really kind of see what is this for? Why, why am I reading it? And also identify Psalms that can communicate what we're feeling, where are we at? What, what am I experiencing in the moment? Well, here's some Psalms that I can actually read as an expression of praise and prayer as, as I go through it. Before we go to uh, Psalm 2, let me just kind of identify again. What, so what's the purpose of the book of Psalms? Well, you know, again, many of these were compiled by or, or developed by David, but there are other contributors. And the Israelites used these in their corporate worship. Yep, they were there for part of their temple worship, but they weren't all choir songs. Many of them were intended just for individual use, devotional, uh, personal devotional time to God and being able to sing to God. And the reality is, is that these weren't all associated with good times, right? So this was intended to be, in a sense, a compilation of worship songs, poetry, verses that they could know and they could recite. And especially it came into to play and help when they were in captivity in Babylon. Especially an opportunity to bring up their praise to God and to not forget. So they could remember the law, but in a sense it was a way that without the temple, without the structures, and then they're in a foreign land of identifying how do we still kindle this worship and this love for God? Well, it's oftentimes through song. I, I've had that experience many, many times, in fact, one of the things I learned early on in my walk with Jesus is that worship is a pathway to move me from where I'm at when I'm frustrated, when I'm angry, when I'm feeling down and low. Worship is that pathway to being in the presence of God and having my thinking and my heart and my emotions more aligned with where God is saying and what he has for me. Any of you experienced that? You're feeling one way, and then you hear a song of worship or praise or something, and you begin to sing it, and it, you're just, you go, you know what, I wasn't thinking this before, but this is right. This speaks to the circumstance I'm in, and it really just it expresses my heart for God. Or it's a song that already you connect and you resonate with it so deeply because it's right where you're feeling. It, it's not changing your perspective. It's just saying you're right. <laughs> your lament is right. The sadness you're feeling is in the right place because this is a sad thing you're going through. Or you're right to be excited. Your God has done a great thing, and so praise the Lord. And so you just sing along with it because it expresses that. Well, that's what the book of Psalms is like, and it's such a wonderful resource for us now to be able to go into those and just speak them and, and pray them out loud as they connect and resonate to where we want to go with the Lord or even where we're at and experiencing God's presence with us right in the moment. So let's pray and then we'll look at Psalm 2. Lord, we do love your word. We, we are strengthened and encouraged by it. We are shaped by it, Lord. It, uh, Lord, does not return back void, but it has its purpose in our life. And so, Lord, for that to happen, uh, we really want to be the type of people who, uh, Lord, are, are moldable, are shapeable, or we want to be soft in your hands, like, like the potter who is creating a vessel, a jar, or, or a bowl, Lord. We want to be able to be shaped in your hands. So help us as we come to the word this morning, Lord, to to not be firm and brittle and, and, Lord, hardened in our ways of responding to you, but help us, God, to, to be compassionate, to be soft, to be humble, or to recognize that we have room still to grow and to be changed. So, Holy Spirit, we invite you to do your work. You are the teacher. And so we... Pray that you would instruct us in the word. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would go beyond what I'm able to share this morning. 
addressing each person right where they're at, in the places, in the deep parts of their heart and their mind of what you want to shape in them, how you want to encourage, how you want to instruct or correct. Lord, we're open to all of those things, so we invite you, Holy Spirit, to do your work. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 2, and again, remember, this is a royal psalm, but it addresses the big picture, and it's kind of an overview of what the psalms are going to be talking about. Royal psalms as a genre, just as a side note, I should put this in here, uh, really address, in, in large part, um, the, the Davidic kingdom and the promise of God over David as king, but it extends much beyond, much farther beyond that, and the aspiration, the desire, and the longing for the messianic king, right? The one who would come, who would be God's anointed, not just for the moment, but for eternity. God's final answer to ruling and reigning and what it looks like when his kingdom comes. And so that's what, uh, that's what royal psalms do, is they usher in this idea of God's kingdom and when he's ruling and he's reigning and contrasting that with earthly rulers. So... We turn to Psalm 2. It says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sit in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Again, Psalm 2 is a compliment to Psalm 1. It takes this idea of the individual who attempts to live apart from God, and it expands it out to rulers and nations who attempt to live apart from God, live on their own terms, and rule on their own terms. It begins, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Right? It's bringing up this contrast of a people specifically a ruler and a nation, the people who are under that ruler's uh, authority, who set themselves against God, who have defied God's instruction and God's rulership in their life. Now, this, is, this contrast is against what does it mean to live under God's rulership? And while God's covenant with the nation, with, with Israel, was very unique and very specific to have him specifically be their ruler, right? He, God wanted to be their God, and you will be my people. This, this refrain, incidentally, is repeated throughout Scripture. Early on, God says, this is my goal. I will be your God, you will be my people. And it even finishes in Revelation, where it says, finally, God is their God, and they are his people. That is God's heart longing, to be able to rule the people directly, to be our Lord, to be king directly. And so this is an expression of that. And we tend to look at Israel, and they have a unique covenant because their intent, the God's intent through them, was that they would be this reflection of what it looks like when God rules in a people. It wouldn't just be all nations, but people would be able to look at Israel and go, those people, their God is the Lord. And this is what it looks like when he's their ruler. But we know how the story goes, right? Over time, they say, well, it would really be nice if we had a king too. All the other nations have kings. So give us a king. God says, you don't want a king. I will be your God. You will be my people. No, we want a king. <laughs> and so... 
the scriptures say, God says, okay, I'll give you a king, but you're not going to like it. <laughs> it's not going to go well. And surprise, surprise. <laughs> God was right. It did not go well. They were busy trying to mimic and, and be a reflection of all of the nations around. We want to be like, right, other nations. God says, why? My intent isn't for you to be like other nations. You are to be a reflection of me and what it looks like when you live under my kingdom, my kingship. And so we recognize that Israel has a unique covenant and God has unique purposes for them. But this psalm, too, it extends out to a broader perspective that, that God has a way of blessing nations, even those who don't have a unique covenant with them. He has a general agreement or a general way of dealing with people and nations and rulers who acknowledge him and who submit themselves under his lordship. It's part of what the book of Jonah is all about, actually. You're familiar with the prophet Jonah. Jonah gets bent out of shape because God says, listen, Jonah, I want you to go to the Ninevites. I want you to go to this people, the town, the city of Nineveh, and I want you to tell them that I'm going to bring destruction on their city unless they turn and repent and they you know, stop doing what they're doing. And the whole story, it's, it's really, um, if, you, if you have a dry sense of humor, <laughs> if you like religious humor, Jonah is your book. It's so good. Because the whole story is about Jonah saying, no, I will not do that. The irony, here's God's prophet, who's one job, you have one job to do, and that is say the things that God tells you to say. And here's the prophet of God saying, no, I won't say what you want me to say. I will run as far as I can away from the people that you're calling me to go to. And the question comes up, well, why? Why would Jonah not want to go to the people and tell them what God wants him to tell them? Here's Jonah's reasoning. Why? God, because they're terrible people and you're a good God. And I know what will happen. If I tell them to repent, and they do, which I hope they don't, but if they do, you will forgive them. You are a compassionate God, long-suffering, willing to forgive. And I don't want them to experience that. <laughs> I want them to be punished because they're terrible people. And so what a, what a hilarious story, right? Jonah running from God. No, I won't tell them. And God saying, go, you're my messenger. You have to do this. Is it right that you want these people to perish? I care about them. I have a heart for them. So when we think about Psalm 2, this is... God saying, I care about people. I, want, I don't want people to be punished. I don't want people to suffer. I, don't want people, I want people to flourish and to thrive. And so this is the battle that Jonah's having. Is He's saying, but I don't care about those people. I want them to be punished because they're bad people. They're my enemies. And God says, well, they may be your enemies, but they're people made in my image who I love and I want to save and redeem. And so go and tell them. That throughout the ages, there's been many people, groups, and nations who have experienced the kindness and mercy of God, who haven't lived under the covenant that Israel experiences, and we're one of those nations, right? We don't have, the United States doesn't have a unique covenant with God. We're a nation, and Israel has the unique covenant with God, where he is a reflection of his purposes. But we have, like many other nations, have experienced God's hand upon us of favor and kindness and compassion over different times and different seasons is we acknowledge his rule and reign. But in other ways, when we don't, we don't experience that. And so it's a very general sense in which this Psalm 2 is speaking about royalty, rulers and nations, when they acknowledge God, his flourishing exists within those communities, within those families, within neighborhoods and even nations. But when they don't, and they move out from the umbrella of, of his care, and then they cease to acknowledge him, then they cease to flourish. But it's interesting, the writer of Psalm 2 begins not with gratitude. He doesn't start out by saying, thank you, God, that you care about the nations. Thank you, God, that you're present with all of those nations who acknowledge you. 
Instead, he begins with lament. He begins with a statement of lament. Because the psalmist recognizes it is not within humankind and human systems of ruling to acknowledge God. Quite the opposite. He begins with something much different. He begins with, why do the nations rage and people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. See, the psalmist knows something from past history and something we see as we look over all of human history that human systems and rulers and the principalities and powers of this world, they don't readily acknowledge God as king. And they don't recognize his anointed Jesus. They set themselves apart as rulers and as kings. They set themselves apart as the final, set, final word. So the psalmist begins not with gratitude, but with lament. Lament because the nations could experience flourishing. Communities could experience fullness of life and thriving. How many of you this morning would just say, wouldn't it be great if in our communities, they were just thriving, everything was working on all cylinders, and, and people were just blessed, and there was healing that was flowing into our community. People were experiencing all that God wanted for them. I mean, all of us would just say yes and amen, right? That would be amazing if the Grand Valley looked like that. But the psalmist says that's, that's not what's happening. The nations could experience that if they would come under his rulership. Instead, it's a lament that the nations rage and resist and attempt to flourish without God. So this points us to one of the key elements of the Psalms. And we'll experience this a little more in depth um, when we get to the Psalms of lament next week. Is, is that lament is an important part of worship. An important part of what the psalmist highlights as he goes through. And, and there's a pattern uh, to the lament. For example, uh, we see a lot of, of uh, lament in books 1, 2, and 3. So the way they're divided out, again, we have these different books and the playlists or the songs that go along with them. In books 1, 2, and 3, there's a significant amount of the psalms of lament exist within those books. And it's more of a, a reflection of the state of the way things are or the way they have been. So some of them you'll hear about David lamenting about, uh, about Saul and his rulership and how he's trying to kill David and pursue him and lament about how broken the system is, how the peoples are unruly and they, they, they can't sit under the, the leadership of God, but they go their own way. And so there's a lot of psalms, royal psalms, that also include with them this lament that, why is it this way? And so it begins, uh, books 1, 2, and 3 have a lot of these in. Then as you move to books 4 and 5, they start projecting forward to the future king. And you hear a lot more psalms of praise and thanksgiving and this, this hope that arises, this faith. There will come one someday where God is ruled, he's ruler, and, and everything just flourishes under his life. And so we read more of those, not exclusively, but we see more of those in books 4 and 5 of the Psalms. So the Psalms of Lament, and particularly in Psalm 2 here, it looks a little like this. The first is seeing people and things as they are. That's the first step to lament, right? Is seeing people and things as they are. How many of you sometimes just say, I just want to close my eyes and not acknowledge any of it, right? <laughs> in fact, um, you know, Jerry sometimes, my wife will sometimes ask me, she'll say, what's happening in the news? <laughs> because she just doesn't have a stomach for turning on and seeing it and watching it. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like watching a car wreck all the time, like turning on the news to watch what catastrophe has happened today in the world. Because that's what, you know, the news thrives on, is pain, sickness, sadness, right? People get energized when they get angry more than they get energized about good news. And so that's why news stations just populate hour after hour of controversy and bad news and bad things are happening all the time in here. And so we look at it and we go, the world is worse than it's ever been. Nope. <laughs> the world is as it has always been. It's just that, you know, good news doesn't make money. 
So we're going to just continually show you hour after hour, bad news after bad news. So I'm kind of Jerry's filter for the news, and I synthesize it, and I go, well, these are the main things you need to know, so you don't have to sit and listen to the same bad news always over and over. Here's the lament, though, of Psalm 2. Seeing people and things as they are. The psalmist says, why does this always happen? Why do nations and rulers always seek their own good and life apart from God? It's a lament. It could go so much better. It could go so much better for them as a ruler, go so much better for the community, for the nation, if they would live under God's compassionate kindness, if they would seek the Lord and his wisdom and his instruction. But the psalmist has this great lament, and he just says, ah, it's never that way, though. They always seek their good. They always seek power. They always seek their own fortune and fame instead of the good for the whole people, which would be to pursue the Lord. So the psalmist sees this, and this is part of lamenting, seeing people and things as they are. It's an important step for you and I, too. We can't just put on blinders and say, no, oh, it's okay, it's all okay, it's all doing right. You know, praise God, it'll all work out in the end. I mean, yes, for those who acknowledge Jesus and King, it will all work out in the end. But... The scriptures don't ever give us space to be able just to put on blinders and not acknowledge the world as it is and disengage from it. In fact, Jesus did just the opposite. He saw things clearly as they were, and he stepped into them, and he brought the kingdom to it. So seeing people and things as they are, to lamenting the pain and brokenness. So I see it, I acknowledge it, and I grieve. I'm saddened. Again, a step that oftentimes I skip. Any of you see yourself through the lens of problem solver? <laughs> it's like, well, I'm done with the grieving. Let's fix it. Let's do something about it. Right? And, and that always goes over well, especially with spouses. Right? I hear what you're saying, but I'm just going to fix it. I don't, we, don't need, we need to move on to fixing stuff right? in, in this. And so the, the psalmist laments the pain and brokenness. He's willing to sit there as they reflect on why do the nations do this? Oh, they continue, they plot against the Lord and his anointed one. There's a lament that's involved. And that involves you and I engaging in the moment, sitting in the moment. And think about Job. And in the Old Testament book where Job has gone through all of this devastation, he's sitting literally in ash and in rags, his, his clothes are torn, and his friends see him from a distance. And they're just, oh my goodness, Job is just so distraught. And, and to their credit, they did some other things that weren't all that great of counsel, but to their credit, they came up alongside of him, and they just wept, and they, they lamented alongside of Job. And they just thought, oh, what has happened to you, Job? We're so saddened. Our heart is so heavy. You know, I wonder sometimes if that's what's missing from followers of Jesus in the world today, is the world around us doesn't see people who are in anguish and pain for them, but just see people who want to fix them and change them. Yes, there definitely are things that need to happen, but part of it is our own lament. Oh, that we got here. Oh, that this is the state of the world. Instead of turning to anger and accusation, that we would sit and lament the pain and the brokenness that exists. But then finishes with looking ahead to a future where it is made right. So not every lament gets to that point, and Psalm gets to that point where it's looking ahead to the future. Some of them, they finish, and you just go, oh, well, that doesn't feel encouraging. But, but don't you know that sometimes the day is like that? I would love it if I could turn out the light every night and go, you know what? It was a bummer of a day and bad things happened. Boy, I sure feel encouraged tonight and I'm ready to take on tomorrow. <laughs> Are there times you turn out the light and your heart's still heavy and the tears still coming down and all you can say is, God help me. God help us. That's the limit, lament. That's the cry of God. Come, Lord Jesus. And the day finishes that way. And that's okay. That's not a state of helplessness. It's just an acknowledgement that some days, some weeks,
sometimes there's seasons of life that are like that. But thankfully, that's not the whole story. That's not where it ends. It never finishes in that final lament that things are just bad and will always be bad. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Aren't we grateful that the psalmist, even in this one, as he exemplifies what a lament that the nations rage, looks ahead to a future where it's made right. And this is what we see in Psalm 2. Seeing the nations and rulers attempt to flourish without God, and they don't show restraint, the lament that it leads to destruction, but then looking forward to a time when the Messiah is on the throne and ruling. <laughs> looking ahead to the time when God will rule and reign and the Son will come, and those who oppress and those who, who don't bring flourishing but bring destruction are called into an account and judgment, and God sets it right that they don't always get to get away with the things that they're doing. And this is such a helpful pattern for us to understand because if, if we don't look at lament as a way of addressing the same things that we see, we're often tempted to jump right in with what's happening in the world around us, and we become the same voice of the nations that are raging. And the church is raging instead of lamenting, and it doesn't have a different sound than the rest of the world. In the church, we should be lamenting and looking forward to a time when Jesus is king as opposed to raging one against the other and trying to overtake the other. We have a different sound. Oh, what a problem we're in. Oh, how things are so broken. Oh, God, how we need you. It leads us into prayer. It leads us into a longing for God to intercede and interact. And it leads us to a place what we look forward to with anticipation when Jesus returns again. And that's why our cry is always, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We need you. Lament isn't a resignation and lack of engagement in the world. It is a recognition that we just have it wrong. It's not a stepping back and saying, well, we've heard the term, it's going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> Literally. Right? Literally, that's what happens with the world oftentimes. And it's not a resignation saying, and so I just wipe my hands of it and let it go. No, it is an engagement that says, and because it is, my heart is broken and I weep and I pray and I engage in the world to see God's kingdom come. Because Jesus opened access when he came to the earth to not just lament the world, but to give us an opportunity to step into the world and bring the kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. To bring his hope and the good news of his life to those around us. The recognition is we get it wrong. We always get it wrong in our histo uh, human systems of governing. We just always do. And, and that's not a slam against any particular government. That's, that's not saying that the Constitution isn't good. It's saying the Constitution is insufficient. The Declaration of Independence didn't actually give us independence and freedom. Jesus does that. And so it, it's not a, a slam against democracy, against capitalism, any human system of governing and leading. It just says it's wholly insufficient for what humans need. We need God to be our God, and we need to be his people. And until that happens, our systems hurt people. They always do. They always end up not in fullness of justice, but in injustice. They don't end up in flourishing. They end up in harming. There's no way for them to get away from it because God is not God, and the people are not his People, So it always leads us to this longing of something more. Scripture says the seeds of every human form of ruling there is destruction that will lead us to lament because no matter the system, people, ruler, and nations always, always, always look to throw off restraint. It doesn't, we could come up with the greatest system in all of the world. We could fix all the little bugs. We could make amendments and all this stuff. But the problem is not so much in the system, it's in humanity. The problem is that I'm broken apart from God. You're broken without Jesus. And therein lies the problem. There's the lament. There's the lament of the psalmist saying, listen, 
we go back to Psalm 1, the problem is, is that we try to live without God himself and we introduce that into the community so then the community no longer flourishes, the nation doesn't flourish. We just propagate this brokenness and that causes us to come to this place of sadness and say it's broken, but it also causes us to look ahead and say, Jesus, thank you that you came and that I can introduce hope and healing through your life into my community. I can bring change to the world around me through Jesus. Lament is the appropriate response. <laughs> in contrast, we often find that Christians resist lament and we join in the raging of nations. We attempt to jump up and wrestle power away from one group so that we can have it. We can get the power, the wealth, the control as if Jesus actually wants to rule through our human systems and he doesn't. He wants to rule the people who are in the human systems because that's what transforms. Jesus pointed us to another way to wrestle people out of control of forces of darkness. Lament says that people are under control of dark forces and we need to see them set free in Jesus Christ. Amen? That is what freedom looks like. That's what thriving looks like. Joining the Raging of Nations says that people who hold different views than us are the enemy and we have to wrestle these systems out of their hands so we can make them act and think like the ways that we want them to. But flourishing happens from the inside out, not the outside in. I, I love what um, Andy Stanley, pastor in, in the Atlanta area, you know, well-known pastor and author, Having gone through the pandemic, and he faced a lot of different challenges in his own congregation and people who you know, had a lot of things to say about him because he's a very popular pastor. But one of the things that he clarified, because people were like, well, you're un-American and you're not fighting for our freedoms, and et cetera. I mean, it was just kind of part of the thing that was going on while churches were pausing and not doing services on site for a while. But... He says, listen, this is, this is what we're getting wrong in the church. He says this, Jesus is not passionate about America. Jesus is passionate about saving Americans. Right? Jesus has no use for saving America. Jesus is passionate about saving Americans. There's an important distinction, church. There's an important thing that we recognize in that. Because we could save America and lose Americans and the Americans that are lost have an eternal time away from Christ. America itself, it doesn't matter what you do, it's going down. That doesn't mean, again, that we just pull our hands away and we don't do anything. It just means, what are you passionate about? Are you passionate about saving a system? Or are you passionate about seeing transformation in the people who live in the nation. Because Jesus is most passionate about Americans. He's passionate about Bangladeshis. He's passionate about Mexicans. He's passionate about Italians. And the list goes on and on. He's passionate about people. And the systems in which they live thrive when those people know Jesus and they are thriving because they bring his kingdom into those systems. And so the psalmist is saying, listen, why do the nations rage? Why are they all in arms? They, they're defiant against God because they have the people themselves haven't been transformed from the inside out. Praise be to God that through Jesus Christ we can be transformed from the inside out and we can bring change to the nation that doesn't just change a law, that doesn't just change a directive from the top down, but it changes people from the inside out where they can truly thrive and flourish so how do we experience the thriving until Jesus comes as king forever? The psalmist says it this way. Kiss the son. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. That's the answer. You and I, when we kiss the son, we turn our face towards Jesus. And an expression of embrace instead of hostility. We lead other people to see Jesus and to kiss the Son, as the psalmist says. 
to welcome him into their life. That kiss is a gesture of, you are welcome here. I acknowledge your authority, your place in my life. That's where real transformation happens, is when you do that, and I do that, and your neighbor does that. You want to see a real revival in your neighborhood and in this valley? Begin to see people's, the, the, the direction of their life move from away from Jesus to Jesus, where they bless him and they kiss the sun. And that will transform everything about our communities and our nation. We help people turn their face back towards God and embrace and affectionately bless and honor His anointed, Jesus Christ. Then and only then will it go well for the nation and its leaders. Anything less than that is really putting a band-aid on a wound that truly needs to be healed. I was reflecting about that as I was finishing up, and we'll wrap up with this. Don't you love how band-aids are skin tone, right? They attempt to be at least. Sometimes it's like really paley skin or peach, you know, but they try to get a skin tone color, right? So it doesn't draw attention, you know, so that it just kind of covers over, just kind of blends in with your skin. I remember at times, the first time somebody told me, I, I put a band-aid uh, on a wound, and uh, they said, well, don't, you don't need to put a band-aid on it. It actually needs some air because it needs to form a scab. That type of wound, you know, it's going to be helpful if you expose it, let it get, because otherwise that moisture is just going to stay a wound under the band-aid. You know, you've got to open it up and let it, uh, let it heal. You know, sometimes that's what I'm more concerned about. That's the lament. As I want things to look good as though there's no wound. And so I want to stick a band-aid on. God, if you would just help me get this together so that nobody can see that there's a problem. You know, I went for years with a deep-seated issue, a life-controlling habit that I just went years and years just putting band-aids over it so that the perception could be, oh, I'm fine. I'm actually doing really well. Inside, I wasn't thriving at all. I wasn't flourishing. I was slowly dying in that area of my life. What I needed was to bring it out into the open and into the light. And I needed Jesus to be able to bring healing to it. You know, the psalmist says that about us. How is our community going to thrive and flourish? How are you going to thrive and flourish in your family? By bringing your life, by bringing your whole self out before the Lord and kissing the Son of him and recognizing his Lordship and saying, Lord, you have it all. And begin that work of transformation. So there's not just band-aids that look like everything's good, but we actually get to the reality of what's there, and how does it need to be healed, and how can we make it?